All right, I want to officially welcome everybody tonight. Uh, my name is Samantha Lurie. I am an adult services librarian for the Northville District Library. And uh, this program tonight, it coincides with our book discussion that we had last night for the Great Michigan Reads on the women of the Copper Country, um, which the main character is Annie Clement. And Lyndon tonight will tell us the true story of this wonderful woman. Um, who lived in the Keweenaw Peninsula of our great state of Michigan. Um, so just briefly, Lyndon did grow up in the Skeegan. So he is a Michigander um, by birth and moved to California in his 20s. Um, but he is one of us <laughs> still. Um, but I will let him talk about how he got into this topic. And I'm going to hand it over to him. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see most of your pictures on the screen because we've got the slideshow kind of taking up most of the screen here. Um, and it's easier, of course, if we're actually in person and I can um, see your faces. And, um, and if I say something really dumb, I'll see somebody's expression, you know, puzzlement. <laughs> but in this case, we won't have that. Um, so um, the reason I got uh, interested in Annie, um, other than I had first heard about the strike from the song 1913 Massacre, and had looked up, you know, what was the background of that Woody Guthrie song, which was later recorded by Bob Dylan and also by Arlo Guthrie and some various other people. And uh, so I'd heard about the strike that way, but didn't realize I had any connection to it. And it was only later in life when I was doing some family research that I found out that two of my grandmother's aunts had uh, lived in Calumet, uh, Calumet, Michigan, that is, and had worked with Annie both before the strike and during the strike. So that made it feel very personal at that point. And, um, and I really wanted to know about the strike. And the more I found out about Annie, the more interested I got in her. So, um, I'm going to try to keep an eye on the clock because it's easy to talk for a long time about her. And I'll, and I'll try to watch the clock here so that we leave room for questions and comments. But I'll, I'll kind of walk you through her life history a bit. Annie's uh, parents were both immigrants from Slovenia. Uh, at that time, Slovenia, it's now an independent country. You may have seen it in the news today because the president of, or prime minister of Slovenia was in Kiev today with, uh, with Zelensky, but uh, I, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian empire at the time that they emigrated here. Uh, then it became part of Yugoslavia, then it became an independent country. They immigrated to the US in the 1880s. Uh, they were at the early wave of the early part of a huge wave of immigration from um, Eastern Europe in particular to the United States that went from the roughly 1880 to 1914, where millions of people, possibly ancestors of yours, came over to this country, most of them entering through Ellis Island. Um, so her father came over here in 83, 1883, her mother in 1886, uh, they met in Calumet in uh, 1887 and married, and, um, and Annie was born in Calumet in 1888. So she was born in this country. She was a U.S. citizen by birth. Um, now, um, she did have other rel relatives who came over. There was an, uh, a lot of people who immigrated um, over here from Slovenia, from rural parts of Slovenia. Uh, and neighboring Croatia and some of these other places. And uh, 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 several of her mother's uh, siblings and at least one of her father's siblings also ended up immigrating here. There was work available, you know, in terms of why uh, people came. You know, life had not been easy over there uh, in, in these areas, particularly in the rural areas. They had only been a, a few decades out of serfdom. Serfdom was a form of semi-slavery. And, uh, you know, 
it was tough to make a living there to, uh, you know, really support a family uh, in any kind of decent way, although people did were self-sufficient a lot. And here, there was uh, a lot of job openings available at that point. That's a whole interesting subject in itself of why was there so many job openings available? It had to do with uh, uh, really developments in capitalism and finance capitalism and so forth. But you know, particularly in mines or in mills for men, there were a lot of uh, jobs opening up. So uh, you could get a job without speaking English and without having any prior skills in that field. So. Uh, Annie's father, George Klobuchar, her maiden name was Klobuchar. Uh, Clemens was, uh, was a married name. Uh, George got a job in the copper mines in the Keweenaw Peninsula. You may know that the Keweenaw Peninsula had uh, been the most important copper mining place in the world for, you know, for a considerable period of time. It had the world's largest deposits of native copper, meaning rather than copper ore, copper that's already copper metal. Uh, and uh, Native Americans used to mine it. Uh, the, uh, so that became the basis of why the copper mines uh, became so important there at a point where the need for copper was growing very rapidly for various kinds of industrial purposes like electric wires. So that's how he was able to get a job uh, readily here as with so many other immigrants. And they went to Calumet because of the jobs available. So. Uh, at that time, Houghton County was just booming. Uh, there, you know, by the time of the strike in 1913, there, there was 100,000 people living in Copper Country. You know, there was, I forget the number, but it was something like 30,000 in the town of Calumet, which I think is less than 1,000 now, you know, because the copper mines have long since closed and copper mining shifted over to open pit mines, you know, in the Western US or in other countries. So that's why they ended up here. Annie's family was quite unusual in one respect. They went back to Slovenia. Uh, when she was about two in 1890 or 1891, they went back to Slovenia, um, to the area of southeastern Slovenia, uh, near the town of Chernomil, uh, near the Croatian border, uh, part of Slovenia called the Bela Krajina. Why did they do that? There's never been a clear answer for that. It may have been partly, oh, thank you for, I'm, I'm gonna forget to announce these photos should go forward. So I'll tell you, you gotta keep on me here. Um, this is um, Annie's parents on the far right. That's her father on the far right and then her mother. And then these are other relatives of theirs. Annie is not in this photo. She was about two when this photo was taken. I assuming, I'm assuming she was inside taking a nap, but, uh, <laughs> But the photo is interesting because it's, um, you know, these are relatives um, of her parents and her parents from before they went back to Slovenia. Um, so let's do the next photo. I don't have a list of the photos in front of me because <laughs> I'll probably forget the order of all these. Ah, okay, here we go. They, there's a, a map of uh, Slovenia, uh, you know, at the northeastern corner of the Adriatic there. Um, and uh, uh, where the, where her town is, is near Karlovac. If we do the next one, it'll be more of a close-up of the map. Yeah, Chernomel is the area where they were from. They came, both her mother and father came from little villages um, near Chernomel. Uh, uh, and uh, her father was, if not the oldest son, certainly one of the oldest sons. He may have felt that he wanted to go back because of family obligations. Um, or he apparently felt some obligation to actually fulfill his military service to, uh, you know, all men there were required to serve in the Austro-Hungarian army for a couple of years. And he may have felt that he eventually wanted to go back to Slovenia and he wanted to have fulfilled his military service. It's an unusual situation because usually these men were doing the opposite. They were part of their motivation for leaving was to not have to do military service in the empire's army uh, where they didn't necessarily identify all that strongly with the army. 
even at a time where it wasn't likely to cost you your life. If you were still in that army in 1914, uh, it, it was very, very dangerous to be in the uh, Austrian army once World War I started. Okay, can we have the next slide? So this is the little town of uh, Chernomo, uh, you know, where that church is probably where they would have gone to church. Um, it, um, the, I think that's a church there in the picture. Can we do the next picture? This is the hillside on which um, Tanka Gora, the village that Annie's father was from. And given the way that the situation worked then, where it was far more likely after a marriage for the family to live near the, the father's home, the husband's home, rather than the wife's home. Uh, so they would have lived on this hillside. Can we do the next slide? This is the actual homestead for the Klobuchar family, for George Klobuchar's family. That house, you can see it's an old stone foundation. The, the brick upper part of the house there was rebuilt. That doesn't date back to when they lived there in the 1890s, that brick part, but that is the location of the house. That's the old foundation. And you can see it's set up as kind of a small little farm. People were heavily self-sufficient on these little farms in terms of you know, having their own chickens or having a cow or, you know, having vegetable gardens and, you know, so forth. Um, they did have a lot of fruit in that area. So people usually had fruit trees. Um, so Annie lived in Slovenia for uh, six or seven years before, um, uh, well, first her father came back to go back to work in the mines in 1895. And then Annie came back um, with her mother and with a sister who had since been born in Slovenia uh, in 1897. Can we do the next slide? So that's just a picture of the boat that they came back on. So that would have kind of been like Annie's experiences, feeling like an immigrant. I mean, Slovenian was, of course, her first language. She wouldn't have remembered much English after leaving the U.S. when she was two and her household all spoke Slovenian in any case. Uh, so it was, would have been like as if she was coming here for the first time in terms of her experience. And of course, they came in steerage. Um, somebody's asking if I remember the name of the boat. I can look it up for you. Um, I do know the name, but I don't have it memorized. Um, the, um, and I think they took it from Bremen, as I recall, and you know went through Ellis Island. Uh, and uh, and she's in the records in Ellis Island, and as is her mother and sister. And then they took a train to uh, the Upper Peninsula. Um, okay, we can do the next slide. So um, that's Annie in the middle there with two of her friends. And um, this is the only picture I found from this part of her life when she's, you know, uh, a young woman. This looks like it was probably even before she was married. Um, she went to school in Calumet, you know, once she came back, but, you know, would have uh, been struggling to learn English and she would have been behind in school compared to the kids who had been in school, you know, since they were five or six. Um, I believe she made it as far as eighth grade. She was um, able to read and write uh, in English uh, and clearly had some schooling. And having an eighth grade education at that point, especially for a woman, you know, for a girl, would have been a pretty good accomplishment, uh, you know, and as a, um, you know, in that kind of working class immigrant community. Um, now, Calumet at that point, you know, uh, there was about 15,000 miners, about 80% of the population were immigrants. So that's who was working in the mines. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the ethnic mix and a complicated ethnic mix. And people tended to live in neighborhoods that were people of their own, um, you know, background. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of Slovenians and also Croatians who were next door neighbors in Europe. And, you know, they could, Slovenian and Croatian is close enough that they could understand each other, especially she was from the part near the border. 
uh, with Croatia. So they could understand each other, even though it's somewhat different languages. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, they had their own bars, their own newspapers and their own language, their own churches and, and so forth, um, you know, with all these different ethnic neighborhoods in, um, in Calumet and the surrounding little towns. So uh, what did she do during this period of time? Her mother was taking in boarders, which was very common, you know, as an additional way to make money, you know, single men. There were many more men immigrants than there were women. There were a lot of women, but many more men. And these single men boarders were often taken in into family households, you know, where they paid rent and provided some income. And the women would be responsible for, you know, the cooking and the housekeeping and so forth. So Annie would have been helping her mother take care of these boarders from a young age. Um, let's see. Okay, I forget what the next slide is. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is one of the houses that the Klobuchar family lived in. Uh, now, this particular house, Annie was already married. I wasn't able to find a, uh, the house that she lived in when she was living with her family isn't there anymore. But um, I put in this photo because her family lived in this house. This is on 7th Street in Calumet. And of course, she would have been going over there regularly, you know, because she lived close by um, after she got married. She got married to Joe Clement in 1906. And uh, they, uh, I'm gonna just check to make sure I said that you're right. Uh, yeah, 1906. By the time they got married, there were several other siblings that had come along uh, that, uh, you know, I'm sure Annie helped to take care of until she got married. Joe Clement was quite a bit older than Annie. Uh, he was also a copper miner, and he was something like 16 years older than Annie. I, I forget the exact age, but uh, something like that. Um, so, uh, you know, they continued uh, living together in, you know, what would have been a very normal fashion for that time in Calumet, but with one big exception. Joe and Annie did not have any children. That was highly unusual. Uh, almost all of the, these young women who were getting married, and they got married young as Annie did. She was 18 when she got married. Uh, they had children, you know, pretty promptly and uh, and they kept coming. And how much of that was because it was a very Catholic community and how much of that is just, I think it was just, you know, that's the way things happened at that time. Um, so why they didn't have any children is unclear. Um, the only thing we can say for sure is that it's not because Annie was incapable of having children because she did later have a child. Um, but that was one thing that was unusual about her, but may have contributed to her becoming such an activist because she wasn't as tied up with taking care of her children as most young women would have been. Um, so the thing that, uh, the other thing that took place in these communities is there were a lot of um, uh, social gatherings, you know, within their community. And you had these uh, fraternal organizations that started, uh, or fraternal benefit organizations. And uh, uh, in the Slovenian community, community, the one that became the largest organization and is still going, uh, the uh, acronym for it is SNPJ. And um, uh, don't ask me to give you the Slovenian name, although I've got it written down in the book, but um, uh, it stands for Slovene National Benefit Association. So this was a combination of a social organization, a gathering place, an insurance thing where they got some amount of, of life insurance or health insurance that you could get through paying dues to the organization. And also could have a distinct political tone to it. And in the Slovene community, you know, the basically there was the Catholic fraternal organizations, which tended to be much more politically conservative, and the SNPJ, which at that point was much more leftist. It is no longer that way. That organization is still going. It no longer has any leftist connections at all. 
but in that era it did um so that's another thing we can talk about more later but um you know it it relates to this whole story um now those organizations were typically very male oriented the snpj originally would only admit male members however in chicago where that organization was based you know because there was such a large immigrant and a slovenian immigrant community in chicago there was uh, a women's equivalent that got started um, under the name nada which means hope in slovenian and um, it was originally just a single chapter in chicago in about 1905 but the word got out in these Slovenian communities about a women's um, organization. The two, the SNPJ and NADA actually merged around 1910, right about the same time that a chapter of this, uh, of this NADA movement started in Calumet. And uh, I, you know, I can't prove this because there was more than one person, let me just shut off this phone. <laughs> there was more than one person named Mary Klobuchar, the mother's name, um, in Calumet, but I feel sure that it was her mother who was, print, who was a principal in this, but Annie was also very involved uh, in 1910 starting this women's chapter. And she was immediately elected president, the first president when this chapter was created. Uh, this is annoying. Um, the, uh, uh, so there's these inklings of Annie becoming a very prominent uh, person as a young woman in her community at quite a young age. You know, she's still uh, at the point she's elected president, she's 22. Um, so she quickly becomes probably the most visible woman in the Slovenian community in Calumet, you know, which was a sizable community of immigrants. Um, and at that time, that organization also included Croatian women because there was no Croatian equivalent. So it was both Croatian and Slovenian women in, the, in that group. And um, my, uh, my grandmother's aunt was elected to be one of the officers in that organization. Um, so again, that was part of the kind of personal connection for it, um, for me. Um, that, um, this becomes quite relevant when we get to the point of the strike, because as far as I can tell, the women in this organization, and almost all of them, you know, were uh, wives or daughters or closely connected to the miners. They seem to have moved en masse into support for the strike and, and strike support activities. So what about the strike? Because the strike is obviously the thing that, that the reason you've heard of Annie, you know, that she became a known person is because of the strike that started in 1913. The, um, you know, you have to realize that this whole place was kind of a company town. The, uh, the copper mines of which CNH, County Mount Hecla was the largest. They controlled this whole area. I mean, you know, they owned most of the property. They even owned the property on which the schools and churches were, were situated. They owned the majority of the housing. You know, this whole thing was a company town. Uh, and uh, they set the rules in conjunction with the other mine owners. The, the other mine owners, they actually had a little, you know, association, or it's not association, really, it's a cartel is what it was, where they would meet together to, to sort out their policies because they didn't want to compete with each other. And, uh, and, you know, the work in the mines was very rough work. And in terms of why the background of why would the union get a foothold in Calumet? It's not just because the wages, you know, were not very good. Um, it, uh, it's because there was a lot of other stuff going, taking place that were also um, very uh, onerous and difficult. And particularly, it was dangerous work. 
there was men dying in these mines every week, people getting injured in the mines every week. I mean, you didn't have coal dust because it's a copper mine, but you know, you've got rock falls, you know, you, you, you know, it's dangerous. And then something happened that was gonna make it potentially even more dangerous, which they were gonna switch from having two men operating one of the drills where you'd have to drill into the rock in order to place the explosives blow up a chunk of the rock so that you could then load it into the ore carts and cart it up outside of the mine. Well, they were gonna switch from two-man drills where you had a partner to one-man drill where you're just gonna to have to do this on your own, which made it feel even a lot more dangerous. So the Western Federation of Miners, which had had some significant successes in the Western part of the US, and it was a mine uh, union that was based in Colorado. They started doing some organizing in Calumet in 1908 to see if there would be interest in the miners joining a union. And so that went on, you know, kind of at a background level, um, under the radar level for several years, but there got to be a lot of interest in it. Although the interest in it really varied according to the kind of relative status and and circumstances of the miners according, which was really heavily done according to their ethnic group. I mean, it, you know, it, it was uh, the situation, even if you did not have experience, if you were a native English speaking person, you got a better job. You know, if you were um, from Northern Europe, you were not English speaking, but if you were from Northern Europe, let's say you were from Germany, as compared to if you were from Southern Europe or Southeastern Europe, you got a better job and better treatment. You know, I may, I'm generalizing here, but that was that was by and large the case. Uh, and it kind of, you know, was a real pecking order there, which I'm sure was partly a conscious divide and strategy kind of stra kind of thing that the mine owners were doing. Um, so the mine union interest really varied according to ethnic group as far how, as how down, far down the ladder that you were. And the Slavs, the South Slavs, meaning like the Croatians and the Slovenians, were basically at the bottom of the pecking order there in Calumet because there were virtually, you know, there were virtually no African-American people or um, very few Hispanic people. Uh, it was mostly people of European descent. Um, so there was a strong interest from them, there was a strong interest from the Italians. They, the oddball ones were the Finns. Um, the Finns, I think, um, the, um, maybe partly because there had been such a strong history of cooperatives in Finland, maybe because of the history of their situation vis-a-vis -vis the Russians or whatever in terms of you know, the things that they experienced, the Finns were very supportive of the Union. You know, again, generalizations here. But you can really, if you look at the data of, you know, uh, who participated in the union, you see this. It's really strongly differentiated according to people's background, uh, with the lowest amount of support for the union coming from people who were native English speakers. You know, um, so the union had gotten a lot of um, enthusiasm from some of the groups, which really increased um, according to some of the things that were going on with, within the mines. And, uh, and in summer of 1913, the miners decided to make a demand for collective bargaining. Because of course, as a, as a worker in this situation, you're facing a uh, ownership cartel, you know, virtually a monopoly. I think the technical name for it is a monopsony. You know, it's a monopoly of buyers. Uh, so you have no bargaining power as an individual worker. It's like, it's basically just, if you don't like it, get out, you know, but then you're gonna face the same situation if you go somewhere else. Um, so they wanted to create a collective bargaining situation to try to increase their power to bargain with the employers. And that, did appeal to a lot of the workers. There were thousands of them that agreed to join the union. And they felt enthusiastic enough to, 
to make a demand to the mine owners in July of 1913 for collective bargaining, uh, which the mine owners did not even respond to their demand letter. Uh, there was not even a response made. Uh, so uh, 10 days or so later, they decided to go on strike. Was this impetuous? Yeah. Um, they struck all of the mines at once. That was a um, very risky thing to do tactically. Um, and, um, um, but you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm. It was the early days of the union movement. I think a lot of people didn't have that much savvy about what it would take, you know, what they were up against. Um, and um, they had set aside enough reserves. The mine leadership, the, the union leadership, really tried to talk them down from, from declaring the strike, feeling that the miners were not ready and did not know what they were getting themselves into. But the workers really wanted to do this and went ahead with it. Um, and uh, of the 15,000 miners, how many participated, you know, were active participants in the strike, you know, you know, part of the union or supported the union? It's hard to get exact numbers, but it looks like it's somewhere in the range of seven to 9,000 at the outset. At the outset, there was a lot of enthusiasm and the strike was successful at the outset. So, meaning that all of the mines shut down. By successful, I mean, they shut everything down. All of the mines stopped working. Mine owners, however, had anticipated that there could be trouble and they had prepared themselves. So um, the most important thing they did was they hired a strike breaking company called Waddell Mahan. That is similar to the Pinkertons, you know, in the same line of work as the Pinkertons. If you've heard of the Pinkertons from other strikes. And the advertisements, if you look at advertisements for that era for Waddell Mahan, they you know, they openly advertise that their business is breaking strikes and that they are successful at it. And actually, as this strike went along, they started including in their ads that they were in the process of breaking this strike. And what did it mean to break a strike? It really meant by any means necessary. Uh, if you were engaging in a strike in this point in labor movement history, Oh boy, was this a rough business. This was very tough stuff. Uh, and they were brought in very early on. Uh, you know, they were, it was about a week into the strike. And you gotta keep in mind that law enforcement in this county is all controlled by the mine owners as well. The sheriff might as well have been a direct employee of the mine owners because he certainly acted like it. Um, and he promptly deputized um, all of these characters or anybody else who was willing you know, to act on behalf of the minors. He, he promptly deputized 600 of these guys so, so that they had the law directly behind them. They were sheriff's deputies. The, uh, and, uh, you know, with Del Mann, they don't, they don't spend a lot of time uh, before they make their presence known. You know, that, um, you know, in terms of um, uh, bullying and getting very physically aggressive with the miners. Now, what are the miners doing in response? Of course, they were putting up picket lines initially. Uh, and I'm sure it was mostly men at the, in the first days on the picket lines. But, you know, the picketers started getting arrested very soon on. And, uh, and a lot of women then started joining the picket lines. And you know, that's where you, Annie first comes into play soon after the strike gets started, where she and these other women start becoming very active on the picket lines in terms of trying to prevent any strike breaking. Strike breaking meaning people going to work. Oh, the SNPJ, okay, I forgot to advance slides again. Okay, the, um, I'll come back to the SNPJ again too. Yeah, here we go with the strike. The, uh, so this is a poster from the Western, I mean, a, uh, you know, a leaflet from the Western Federation of Miners. Okay, can we do another picture here? 
Yeah, that's Annie again. Let's do another one. So um, I've got several pictures of here, Annie, and what they refer to as the parades. So you start having a progress, a progression on the part of the strikers from picket lines to marches, what they at the time called parades. And uh, this is to really try to, you know, raise people's morale for the strike and demonstrate how, much, how large the community was of people participating in the strike. Um, you know, something other than just the straight manning the picket line kind of situation. Keeping in mind, there were a lot of picket lines that you'd have to do too, because there was a number of mines. So the, the, these marches or parades really became the uh, core representation of the strike and is the reason that Annie became famous. That's Annie holding the flag in the middle of that picture. The person riding the horse there, the white horse, that's Charles Moyer, who's the national president of the Western Federation of Miners, who came out from Colorado at different points during the strike. The person on the far left with the hat tilted back and the mustache, <clears throat> that fellow, um, and watch me blank out on his name, but he is the, um, Goggin is his last name. Um, he is their principal organizer for the Western Federation of Miners in the Keweenaw. Uh, and he and Annie became very um, close uh, during the course of the strike. I don't mean romantically close. I mean that, that um, he just became such an admirer of Annie's um, strength and the role that she was playing. Um, okay, we can do another slide. So this is another picture of one of these parades in this case, you can see they've got a marching band as well. Um, and Annie carrying the flag. I gotta say something about these flags. People don't understand this today because it's, it's not something that would occur to you today, but that flag is, a, that's a, that was highly controversial at the time that they were carrying those flags because as far as the English speaking population of the county was concerned, that was not legitimate. They regarded these people as foreigners, regardless of whether they had citizenship status. Annie, even though she was born in the US, she was not a native English speaking person. They regarded her as a foreigner. Uh, her parents, you know, who were, I forget if they had gotten naturalized yet. It was relatively easy to get naturalized as citizens in those days. Her father was at least in the process. I can't remember if he'd already gotten it yet. He would have been considered a foreigner. They, the, Angli the English speaking people regarded this as totally illegitimate that these people were carrying American flags. They were not entitled to do that as far as the people who were opposed to the strike were concerned. So this was very much of a political statement to carry the American flag. These people were, you know, these strikers were saying, we're Americans. And the people who were opposed to the strike were saying, no, you're not. The, um, so this question about citizenship, the rights of citizenship, there are a lot of echoes of this still today, right? Um, so this is one of the really important backdrops of this whole thing. This is not just a, a narrowly defined labor struggle, what you see going on here. Let's do another slide. Yeah, there's a close-up of Annie again carrying a flag. She always carried the American flag. I should say, Annie, if you didn't hear this already, she was big. She was often known as Big Annie. She was tall. She was at least six feet tall, maybe more than six feet. Um, so she really stood out. There were very few men who were that tall. You know, people were mostly shorter in that era. Um, so she was very visible. Uh, the uh, Okay, we can do another picture. You know, here's, uh, you know, walking down the main street of, I forget now if this particular one is in Calumet, probably. Um, the, um, walking down a major street. And um, Annie is actually the one over at the right. Why she looks shorter in this picture, I don't know, but but there, this one was actually a published picture that had a caption. And the one where she's got the um, holder for the big flag um, uh, was described in the picture as being Annie. 
Uh, and you can see, you know, these parades have got lots, it, look at how far back it goes. You know, you can't see the back end of this. They were really a, a big deal. There was a lot of spirit behind these things. Okay, we can do another picture. Yep, another picture of, you know, you know marching and on the strikes with some other women there with her. Now, this one I thought was an interesting picture because it shows how disciplined these things were. People were really into demonstrating how disciplined they were in their strikes. Um, this is different from <laughs> the version of rallies I've been to never looked like this. Um, you know, that um, this was an expression of seriousness that they did it this way. Um, you know, have it really organized like that with these, you know, these are strikers and these long lines like this. Uh, but the backdrop, so you've got this, you know, very spirited display from the strikers. And you've got this backdrop of, um, of Waddell Mahan and, you know, uh, and boy, they're, you know, if you haven't heard this already, a turn of the century strike was really rough business. And the Waddell Mahan people at one point uh, tracked down a couple of strikers, followed them back to their rooming house. They were, these were a couple of Croatian men. And they went into their rooming house and shot it up, you know, and it was families living in there. And uh, they killed two men who were, ironically, were not even the men that they were chasing back there and injured several other people, including a child. And, you know, uh, of course, none of them ever went to jail. Unusually enough, the DA actually did prosecute them, but but you know nobody went to jail for them. I mean, you know, this is. I don't know to what extent these folks understood this when they engaged in the strike. The mine leadership understood it, but whether these folks knew what they were getting into when they got when they went into the strike, I suspect. Uh, I got a question here. Are the dressed up ones thugs? No, the dressed up ones are strikers. You know, the people marching, these are strikers. You know, they're all wearing good clothes. They're trying to show how disciplined they are. They're trying to show their seriousness by being dressed up like that for this parade. Uh, that, uh, that, you know, they're serious about their demands about wanting to be taken seriously as um, as workers who deserved fair treatment. And really, like I say behind that, that they deserve to be taken seriously as Americans and ultimately as citizens. Uh, the, uh, I think we tend to take the meaning of the word citizen for granted these days. It was not always so. <laughs> the, uh, it, you know, it was a big deal at one point who had the rights of citizenship and who and what rights of citizenship. Um, okay, another picture. Okay, this is Ben Goggin, the same fellow I mentioned before, next to Annie. Well, you know, Annie in, in this picture, and you see him, uh, one of the men on horseback, one of the other elements they had to deal with here is that the Michigan governor pulled in the entire Michigan militia, about 2,500 men into this strike. So that's the you know, equivalent today of the National Guard. Uh, and had them camped out, you know, in and around Calumet. And, you know, even though their official role was just keep the peace, you know, in reality, that basically meant that the ones who were viewed as being the troublemakers were the strikers, the miners. So, you know, in effect, they're there, you know, on behalf of the mine owners. You see Andy's hand is bandaged there. She's got a uh, wrapping around her thumb. She has just been in a confrontation that's got, they got a lot of write up in the local press. The miners started their own newspaper called the Miners Bulletin. So this got a lot of coverage in the Miners Bulletin because, you know, as this got rougher, the men were often being jailed. There was lots and lots of arrests and the women were taking on more and more of a prominent role Annie's carrying her flag out there in the, those picket lines. She got arrested multiple times, many times. Um, and one of these guys came up with her, with her, uh, with their um, their sword, and um, and you know, pushed her back and actually cut her with his sword. That that's what she's got. 
her finger wrapped around where he cut her with his sword. Um, and, uh, and she famous, famously dropped the flag down to kind of a horizontal level and said, you can kill me if you want, but you're gonna have to stab me right through this flag. Uh, which if he was, if she was a man, maybe they would have done it, but that's where the point where they held back, they just settled for cutting her. Um, then he really saw himself as trying to protect Annie. Um, he just loved what she was doing. And I think he was trying to serve as, as her guardian in this situation. But you can see how she's become kind of a rock star already. Look at these, all these young people around her. Uh, where she has become so known already in the community at that point. By the way, they had some people from outside coming all during the strike. Mother Jones came fairly early on, you know, who was a famous, nationally famous lo labor leader to, you know, lend support to the strike. So it was in the labor press, it was getting a lot of coverage, the strike. The strike was a big deal. So, you know, it's this very tough situation, but very spirited. This picture, by the way, is from September. So they're two months into the strike. There's still a lot of energy going on. Uh, but, you know, as the strike is going on and, uh, you know, it's carrying on and on, the, the, there's no negotiation taking place. The owners are not negotiating at all. They're bringing in strike breakers and having some success with that. You know, they've got these uh, uh, Waddell Mayan characters who, you know, they they were referred to as thugs by the, the strikers and you know these guys were you know they they actually were apparently recruited from gangs in places like new york a lot of them came from new york um it, uh, and you know they were doing all kinds of stuff to try to disrupt the union i mean not just attacking the picketers uh not just protecting strike breakers not just you know harassing people outside of their their homes when the union held meetings, the these guys would these Waddell Maiden guys would go to try to break up the meetings. You know, they would they would go in and try to disrupt them and stop the meetings. A number of times the meetings were held at the Italian Hall. So that's part of the backdrop of, of the Italian Hall. So at any rate, the, this is getting rougher and rougher. Then you got this thing called the the uh, Citizens Council. Uh, I forget if I'm quoting that name exactly, but the, you know, basically it's the, the community of people who support the mine owners locally. And a lot of the shop owners and so forth, the English speaking community, they formed their own organization and they had done similar things that in other parts of the country, the citizens association kind of thing, where to try to, to, try to oppose the unions. It was really the equivalent of the white citizens councils in the South in the 60s, you know, where they saw themselves as being the, uh, the protectors against these, um, these people who wanted to upset the whole old way of doing things. Um, and, uh, you know, that also became the part of the backdrop of, against this getting, turning uglier and uglier. You know, this just got rougher and rougher you know, as the months went by. I'm talking way too much here. I just looked at the clock. Sorry, folks, I'm not keeping a good track of my time here. Um, the, uh, so let's jump then to the Italian hall where all of a sudden we're in December. This is the Italian hall. So this is the second floor of a building right in the middle of the kind of Croat Slovenian community on 7th Street. And as I mentioned, the, you know, this is a, the second floor is where they had the meeting hall. Downstairs was a bar. Um, and this is um, a place that the union often used to, to hold meetings. Now, what's happened in the meantime is that Annie and the women that she was with from the um, SNPJ, I think were a lot of the leadership of this, have formed a women's local of the union back in September. Um, the uh, it was called an auxiliary local, which I think was a stupid thing to put that word auxiliary. Uh, there was nothing auxiliary about this. You know, these women were fighters, you know, in terms of, I mean, in terms of, you know, really strong supporters of the strike. Uh, 
And I have to say that the union leadership and the men, it took them forever and a day to, to finally dawn on them that the women were providing a lot of the energy for this strike. So Annie and a lot of her women friends from the SNPJ, you know, they, they all became part of this local and Annie was immediately elected president of the women's local uh, of the Western Federation of Miners in Calumet, uh, local number 15. They were card carrying members of the union. Um, and um, they also were having their own meetings and strike activities. And, you know, it was a whole complicated process as well in terms of across ethnic groups you know, where they had to do this in multiple languages and they had to have speakers speaking sequentially in different languages. You know, this was a really complex multi-ethnic operation, um, which also has interesting parallels to the present. So, you know, by Christmas rolls around and things are really rough. I mean, you know, miners haven't been paid, their strike funds, which were very meager to begin with, have run out. You know, it's bad. So, Annie and the other women in the local decide they're, they're going to organize a Christmas party for the children. And, um, and they go out and, and round up gifts and there's gifts being made, you know, like knitted, knitted uh, mittens and things like this, you know, that they could give to the kids. And that's then, you know, gets held on Christmas Eve. It was gonna be a kid's party in the afternoon to be followed by an adult's party at night. The adult's party never ended up happening. And uh, this party was just the most horrific thing as it turned out. I mean, it went by, it was fine. They were not, the union was not doing much guarding at the door because it, it was just kids going in and out, you know, children of minors, plus some of their mothers. Uh, there was only a handful of men around, you know, who, you know, nominally guarding, but really all they're doing is that when they finally start giving out kids, uh, presents to the kids, really the only thing they're doing is trying to make sure that the kids don't double dip on the presents because they're having enough trouble just, you know, making the presents go around for all the kids who are there. And Annie was the MC. She was up on that stage, the MC. They had a Christmas tree, which you can still see on the right. This was taken the day after. And, uh, you know, and the room was packed with these kids and also some mothers and so forth, even though it's getting to the end. And, um, and a guy came at the entrance of the door. You can't see the doorway here. It's not that far door at the left. It's, it's right, you know, to the left of where all those chairs are at the front. They're the main door going out to the main stairway. And a guy came up and yelled fire. Um, and, uh, he yelled it a couple of times. There's many witnesses to this. He was wearing a, a button, an anti-strike button. And um, why would he wear a button if he was a provocateur? Probably because Waddell Mayan in general wanted the, minor, the strikers to know who they were facing. They wanted people to know uh, you're facing us and you're gonna lose. Now, was this guy actually intending to murder dozens of people? I seriously doubt it. I think he thought he was just being cute. He was gonna break up their meetings like they always try to do. And the fact that it was a bunch of kids, I don't think he cared. You know, whatever it was, it was some kind of minor thing gonna happen. He was just trying, he was gonna break it up. Um, he did have his hat pulled over his head low. I don't think he wanted to be personally identified. The people who did see him, none of them could identify him except one kid said that claimed that he had seen this guy, um, you know, I think it was with other strike breakers or something, but um, otherwise nobody could recognize this guy. And, um, and he started a panic. You know, when he yelled fire, the kids panicked and Annie up on the stage is trying to yell, don't run. She could see there was no smoke. There was no sign of fire. And she was probably on edge the whole time that something might happen. So she was yelling out, trying to get people to stop. And then there was no fire. And the other women up there with her were trying to get her, to, trying to, to calm this down. And they couldn't calm it down. The kids jammed the stairway. Can we do the next picture? There's the stairway. That's it. There's where they all died. You know, the, the doors at the bottom were not held shut. 
the 1913 massacre song was wrong in this respect. The doors did not open inward. There's two sets of doors there. There's an outer doors and inner doors. The inner doors were double full doors. They did not open in. They didn't have room to open in. But um, it, so it wasn't that the doors were held. It's just that this was a stampede by these kids down the stairs. One kid fell and then the whole wave of them came afterwards, mostly kids, some adults. There was 73 people who died on that stairway of suffocation from that stampede. The uh, 59 of them children. You know, it was horrific. Um, Annie was person. Annie was up in the room, you know, there's still people trying to get down the stairs. You can't get down the stairs. It's just completely jammed with bodies. Annie thought that the doors were being held at the bottom by strike breakers because she couldn't figure out why else nobody was being able to get down the stairs. And they started yelling at people to get out the windows in the back. And there was also a fire escape in the back. And they were sending everybody out the windows and down the fire escape. Meanwhile, some, some guys from below had heard this happening and heard all the screams, some guys down in the bar and came running out and tried to pull people out of the bottom. They couldn't get a single kid out of the bottom of the pile. It was, the bodies were stacked so high in that staircase, they couldn't get anybody out. They called the fire department. The fire department was only two blocks away. They were there within five minutes. These guys were climbing up ladders to the back windows up to the second floor. And all they could do is just start pulling people away from the top. But it just, it wasn't fast enough. People suffocated before they could get them out. So, you know, it was a, it was a massacre. The, uh, and, uh, you know, that's the Italian Hall Massacre. So that event was so shocking that honestly, I don't think anybody who was present ever completely recovered. I don't think Annie ever completely recovered. Samantha asked me, was her life kind of heavy ever after, after she had a kid and went to Chicago and stuff? I don't think she ever got over this. You know, the, these were her kids. They have a quote in one of the newspaper articles of her holding one of the dead kids that's been pulled out of the stairway. And she, she's saying, you know, they're all my children. You know, I think she almost literally felt that way. Um, the, uh, you know, all these bodies laid out on that second floor there before they got taken to the morgue. Uh, if this was deliberately induced panic, you know, which would be a felony, um, even if there was no one who died, then this is murder. You can argue about what degree of murder it was. This is murder. This was mass murder. This is the largest mass murder in the history of the state of Michigan. And there was no criminal investigation. Why was there no criminal investigation? I think because the sheriff either knew or suspected all along who did, who did it. And he didn't want to go there. There was a, uh, you know, the coroner's investigation, um, you know, where they had to rule a cause of death, you know, which basically was just suffocation on the stairway. The coroner interviewed some people, including Annie, didn't ask any very pointed questions. Uh, and that's it. There was never any investigation of this thing. Uh, the, uh, so, you know, that caused a, you, you might have thought that the mine owners would have been so shocked themselves that this had happened, which got the national news, um, that they would have backed off. You'd be wrong if you thought that. Two days after this, when you know the the president of the unit, the union was staying in Houghton, you know, I, I mentioned him. They sent a group of these characters, these citizens association and what else, people into his hotel room, shot him, dragged him out, beat him up, debated about whether to throw him over the bridge into the into the river to drown, and finally decided instead to just. Uh, tell him to get on the train and, and they'd finish the job if he ever reappeared again. That's two days after the Italian Hall. The, um, so no, they didn't back down. They did offer to pay money to the parents 
of the dead children, supposedly to help with funeral expenses. As far as I can tell, they all said no. They said it was blood money, they wouldn't take it. Can we do the next drink? Next gent. This is the funeral procession. You can see there, they're carrying a casket there in front. The funeral procession, is, as far as I can tell, was probably the biggest public event that ever happened in the, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I mean, there was thousands and thousands of, of people at this thing. They, the funeral procession reached the cemetery two miles away before the back end of it had left Calumet. Um, the, um, and they did mass graves, which is best they could do. The ground was, of course, frozen rock hard. Um, you know, in the in the cemetery there, uh, the uh, where you know they're still buried there today. Um, you know, they laid them out in rows. You know, here's another shot. That's that that shot there, the furled flag, flag which is furled with black bunting. You can't see her because she's turning around looking backward. But the hat with the black ribbon on it, that's Annie. Uh, the uh, carrying her flag, but with the flag furled with black, black crepe, you know, in the funeral procession. Um, okay, next slide. So what happens in the wake of this? Annie, who's been arrested many times, she goes to jail. Oh boy, I'm even further behind schedule here. It's five after five already. I gotta speed it up. Um, she goes on, the, the mine union is having a terrible time trying to keep this sustained. Ella Bloor, who's a, you know, one of these folks, she's not the stature of a Mother Jones, but she's one of these people who's been around the left forever. And she's in, in and out of Calumet the whole time. And, she offers to take Annie on a national speaking tour to try to raise money for the strike. So this is where they're departing Calumet to go to Chicago, where they first go for this. And uh, Ella talks a lot about this in her memoirs that she writes dec decades later. Um, by the way, in her memoirs, there is only one person in the entire book out of the hundreds of people that she mentions in that book. There's only one person that she uses the term heroic for. And that person is Annie. Um, so they go on that speaking tour, but they can't raise nearly enough money to make any difference. And meanwhile, Annie was been in and out of jail, and her marriage with Joe has gone onto the rocks. And she's met this journalist from Chicago, a Slovenian guy named Frank Frank Shaws, who's up there covering the strike. And they start a relationship, and um, and she is pregnant by the time this picture is taken. I don't know if she knows it yet, but she's pregnant. Um, apparently, Frank is the father. Um, on the birth certificate, he is listed as the father. Um, okay, next picture. There's Frank. Uh, best picture I could find of him. Um, so in April. The, they give up, the strikers give up, uh, and they vote to, to disband the strike. They do not let the women speak. Um, they, they are not allowed to vote. You come back to that citizenship question again, even within the mine unions, the mine workers. The women who end up becoming the backbone of the strike are not allowed to vote about whether to continue or not. Annie would have certainly voted to continue. She was, you know, very determined. Um, but they voted to shut down the strike. The ones who were identified as being strong union members were all blacklisted. They could no longer work in Calumet or any other copper, uh, copper mine um, anywhere else. Um, and um, Annie leaves, and a lot of these folks left. Um, and really, I think the heart of that town was broken myself. I, I, you know, but. Obviously, there's a lot of economic things that happened in subsequent years, but I don't myself feel like that town ever recovered from what happened during that striking, and especially the Italian hall. But here she is in September. She has moved to Chicago. She divorced Joe. He was alcoholic and abusive. I'm sorry to say that all of her husbands, she had three husbands ultimately, 
all of them were abusive alcoholics. Um, it really did not work out with her with her marriages. Um, this is her daughter, Darwinna, known as Dot, who was born in the fall of 1913 in, uh, in Chicago. And that became the start of a whole other chapter of Annie's life, where she continued as an activist in the Slovenian community. And if I wasn't so far behind schedule, I would tell you more about that. But she was quite active in the Slovenian left in Chicago for the next few years. In fact, it basically operated out of her kitchen. Um, her husband was a writer for the uh, JSZ newspaper. The JSZ was the Slovenian language, or actually South Slav, so Slovenian, Croatian, both, language federation within the Socialist Party of America, which was the biggest thing going on the left in that pre-World War I period. Uh, downstairs from her lived Ivan Bolak, who was the best per known person in the Slovenian American left. If we do another picture, we'll see him. Oops, proletariat, that's the paper I just mentioned. Annie was a member of the Socialist Party. There's Ivan Bolak. Um, so they lived in the same house. The way he's got his arm casually wrapped around her, you know, it makes, makes you wonder. But at any rate, they lived in the same house. And that's that. That by this point has already lost her left arm. It was knocked, you know, she had her left arm torn off by being hit by a streetcar right in front of the house. So that was another tragedy that happened. Um, the, uh, if there hadn't been enough already. Um, so, you know, she is not, never has her name in any of the publications. This Ivan Molik in his memoirs barely even mentions her. But uh, the main operations of the Slovenian left, which was a significant thing at that moment in the Slovenian community, are happening in that neighborhood, Woodlawn in Chicago, and you know, within a block of her house, and a lot of it happening right there in her kitchen. Okay, next slide. So that's a little older. Uh, 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 Darwin is getting older there. Um, and uh, uh, Annie gets into the hat business, I assumed originally with um, union making, union hat shops, but um, later owns her own hat shop. And why don't you just flip through the rest of her sli the slides here? You know, these are with friends mostly. We'll have a couple where that's Darwin are getting older. Um, you'll see a couple of Annie's hat shop. There's one, you know, Darwin is running the register there. Um, that um, uh, and Annie's there with the, in the middle with the gray hair. Um, so you can just flip through the rest of these because um, you know she did well for a while there. You can see her in front of her car, but um, uh, that's Annie's third husband. Another problem. <laughs> um, the uh, marriage did not last long. Um, you know, her daughter got married. Her daughter's marriage was the same story, abusive alcoholic, but had two kids that came out of it she dearly loved. And Annie did too. So Annie got to become a grandmother in, in the older part of her life. Um, Annie with friends. I got these photos from Annie's great, um, great granddaughter who was her closest living descendant and who ironically knew very little about Annie. Um, the, uh, the stories did not get passed down. So it, I sped through the last part here because I went way over time-wise, but hopefully we still got some time for questions. Yeah, I think we had a few questions. Let me go back. Um, okay, so we had somebody asking what, what the song was, which was the 1913 Massacre by Woody Guthrie. And yeah, just go on YouTube, look up 1913 Massacre song on YouTube, and you'll see several different versions of it available. The lyrics of it are pretty powerful. The lyrics are not 100% accurate. They come from Ella Bloor, but they're certainly emotionally accurate. Did you know the name of the boat that her family came over on? Uh, if you... <laughs> I do, although it may take me a second to pull it up. Ask me another question while I'm seeing if I can pull it up. 
Okay, we did have a question, the risk outcome for miners that worked full time like these folk did. I don't see the native folk mining full time. Uh, I'm trying to understand the question, you mean Native Americans? I think that's what they meant. Native Americans, I don't think we're doing any mining at all by the time period we're talking about. They, they had been mining for thousands of years there because it's known from archaeological work where they can identify the copper as being from the Keweenaw, from, you know, that got tri traded over a lot large area. Um, the, um, uh, I see somebody's asking a question. I meant the toxic burden of miners. I don't know the answer about whether the whether there was any toxicity in the mining process as compared to the um, reducing them to the extent they mined ore rather than native copper because there were both things there. You know they would have used toxic chemicals in reducing the ore to metal. Um, a lot of these guys were not working in the uh, in that part of the operation, they were more working in the mines themselves. And the kind of work they were doing is again, largely segregated by class in the form of ethnicity. So the South Slavs ended up being trammers, the one who had to push carts is ore carts, typically. I mean, those are generalizations. We had a question, were there any moles in the unions? Oh, I, I don't think they even needed to have moles. I think there was probably a lot of um, people who, you know, had such, um, the whole thing would have been so complicated for them in terms of the, the priorities that they had to balance. How are they gonna feed their family? Um, you know, how, they're, how are they gonna keep themselves going during this strike? The union, oh boy, this was gonna be very challenging and damaging. I'm sure there were a lot of people who had somewhat mixed feelings. And you know, the number of men who, who were participating in the union really declined as the strike went war on month after month. You know, they were being ground down. A lot of them had to leave town to try to get some income for their families um, without being strike breakers. Uh, the, uh, so the ones who became strike breakers, obviously they could get paid. If they weren't being strike breakers, they wanted to get some income after the you know, strike reserves were gone. I mean, th this happened with Annie's father. Annie's father had to leave town to try to get some money for the family um, so that they could eat. Um, so, uh, you know, no, I doubt if they, they did anything as complicated as trying to plant specific moles. They might have, but they were probably found it easy enough to just arrest somebody and say, you know, you better tell us you know, what you know about this union or you're gonna be sitting in this jail cell for the next 30 days. Um, you know, as I'm gonna guess is probably what they did most of the time. There was one question, um, were the majority of men abusive alcoholics in general and that followed them into the marriages? Um, I wouldn't know of any way to get any, data about that or statistics about that. I, you know, I think it was alcoholism, I think was not at all uncommon. You know, these taverns were everywhere there. You know, some of my relatives were, you know, in, uh, tavern owners and, and so forth. Uh, Annie's family lived above uh, a tavern, a pub, you know, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what the name was at the time, but a tavern. They lived right up on the second floor above them you know, uh, above one of these that was actually owned by one of my relatives, you know, in downtown Calumet. So alcoholism, I'm sure was very common. Um, and, you know, I have to believe that, um, you know, it just wasn't uncommon, but I don't know of any way to get any data about that. Does anybody else have any questions um oh we had some a comment uh, uh gary and sue said my great grandfather worked for the tamarack mine from 1895 to 1918 as did two of his sons
My grandmother was born in Calumet in 1900. Family moved to Milwaukee in 1918. The home they lived in in Tamarack still stands, and I was the first descendant to step foot in the house several years ago. Another good book about the region in time is Tamarack Town by Paul Steele. I guess so that's something to share with the group. I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves. So if you did want to say something aloud rather than writing in the chat, you are welcome to. By the way, I found out, I, I just couldn't find it fast enough. The, the name of the boat that Annie's father came back on was the SS Sardinian. But I, in doing this in two seconds, I couldn't. Oh, here it is. SS, I think this is it, the name of the ship. Yep, it's the Sal, S-A-A-L-E. Whoever wanted to know the name of the ship that she came back on, that's the name. All right, thank you. Uh, we had one question from Frankie. Do you know whether the families were required to feed the inmates? Oh, when the people were in jail. Hmm. I haven't seen anything that addressed that point. I mean, I could, I could readily imagine that if you didn't want to get, if you don't want to survive on more than a slice of bread a day, somebody better bring you food. I don't, I don't know if they even heated those jail cells. Um, you know, it would have been very crude. Uh, Annie got very sick at one point, uh, and uh, they, uh, you know, in January. I'm sure part of it was just the stress from this whole thing, including the Italian Hall. Plus, she had apparently been in jail for some amount of time, and she was. You know, there's a writer who talked about having seen her at home, and she was deathly ill. But she did recover from it within, you know, several weeks. Um, I saw a question come up of how did they, what do they do with the caskets? Well, you got to remember these people were miners, um, so with ground that was frozen as hard as rock, they went out there with pickaxes and dug trenches, um, hand dug trenches, and just did long trenches. There are some photos that survive of these long trenches with the caskets buried in them, you know, one after another after another. So there was basically two sets of trenches, one on the Protestant side of the cemetery and one on the Catholic side of the cemetery, because the miners were a mix of Catholic and Protestant, again, mostly depending on ethnicity. Are there any more questions from the audience? Well, sorry, I flew through this so quickly in terms of the latter parts of Annie's life, which most people know very little about. Um, but I, I went way over my time limits of how long I was supposed to speak. Um, and um, so I apologize about that. That's okay. Oh, we've got some good comments from the audience that's saying it was a wonderful presentation. I wanna formally thank Lyndon for coming. Uh, zooming in with us from California and sharing the story of Annie's life with all of us. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and thank you for attending everybody and I'll say good night. That's it, are we wrapped? Yeah, I think so. I'm just gonna turn the recording off, yeah. Okay.